So today we're here with Rod Maxwell. Rod, where did you attend high school and what year did you graduate? Windsor High School, 1969. What sports did you play in high school? Uh, track one year, baseball four years, basketball four years. Talk about your high school sports career from your freshman to senior year. Hmm. Probably not too many people want to hear about that, but uh, no, I, I, I played three years of varsity uh, basketball, four years of baseball, one year of track, and that had enough of that. Uh, I, did, I really didn't like to run, so to be involved in sports that you have to run was kind of a oxymoron. But Who were some of your teammates and coaches? High school, my teammates, uh, Mel Austin. Uh, Lanny Bridges, Eric Rinker, Rick Ratliff, Dan Seifert. Uh, we had we had a good bunch. We weren't very big, but we were, you know, we had a lot of fun, and we we always ran into trouble when we saw Beecher City. Back in in our day, was that was a team to beat. They had the the Julius boys and Howard Dust, and I think it was Ron Beck or Dave Beck. I forget. I apologize to <laughs> Mr. Beck. But they were big and they were good and they liked to press and we didn't get to play much offense against them. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about some of the teams and players that you played against in high school. Mm. Well, uh, you can always start with uh, uh, St. Anthony and, and, and T-Town. The time you got run over by them, why then, you know, everybody else you felt like you had a fighting chance. But, uh, uh, you know, we had Lawrence Carey. He, yeah. he was... You know, he may still be coaching something today. I, I have no <laughs> idea, but uh, man, they they were big because Le, uh, Leon and and uh, Joel Clark. You know, those guys were mm -hmm. were so big. And coach would give us our assignments at the start of a basketball game and say, "Okay, you got." So and everybody was <laughs> when we got out to center court. We said, "We can't guard Leon. Why bother? I mean, he's so big." <laughs> you know, and uh, um, Saint Anthony, I did Mike Winnie. Uh, you know, that was always mm -hmm. my job, and I always ask Coach, which part of him do you want me to guard? <laughs> you know, it was like, can't guard all of I mean, he's, him. He's too much. He was really good, too. Talk about some of your favorite facilities in high school. Oh, uh, Alamont for the conference tournament was always a highlight. That was, that was a, a, a fun, you know, a uh, fun gym to play in. Uh, I liked uh, Shelbyville. When we always played in the Shelbyville Invitational back then, and that was a really good good facility to play in. And uh, purely from a court standpoint, Finley was probably the best. It was the best jumping floor that I've ever been on. You know, it kind of made you feel like that you didn't have white man's disease. You know, when <laughs> when you uh, when you got on that court, but it it was really that was probably my my, my single favorite one. And, and we usually managed to win when we were there. Yeah. Like you know the way it is now. Any other high school stories you'd like to add? High school stories? Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah, I've got it. I I do have a, my uncle Max Sexton. Uh, we were playing in the Shelbyville Invitational. I'll never forget this. My junior year, and uh, we were playing Clinton in the third place game, and I I was having a, a a pretty good game that night, and I think I'd been to the foul line like sixteen times, and I was sixteen for sixteen, and all of a sudden. I look under the basket, and there my uncle is. He's standing under the basket, barely in bounds, and he's got his his like his trench coat over his arm, you know. And and I think the the baseline official was like, you know, what are you doing? And and so he just got him to move off out of the way. But he was no toy. He would show up in the locker room at halftime. Uh, just he was he was nuts about about the sports if there was a game to be played why he he'd be there he'd be but he there, was yeah. under the basket at that we did go on to win that game by like three or four points by the way but um i missed that next free throw <laughs> yeah. is there any awards you like you had in high school or anything like that hmm. i don't know i think i might have been got the i don't know even what they call it anymore the uh conference player of the year type mm -hmm. thing my senior year you received I, I, that yeah wow yeah so after high school, where did you attend college? I went to OCC down at, at Olney, two years down there, played baseball and basketball. And then from there, I went on to Eastern, played baseball. Who recruited you? Uh, well, Gary Cardinal, uh, who was an assistant 
uh, basketball coach at Olney and the head baseball coach recruited me out of high school. Mm -hmm. uh, Don Eddy from Eastern back at that time and, and we had contact with uh, uh, Southern, Western, you know, uh, Milliken, Illinois Wesleyan. There, there was a number of them, you know, that, that needed somebody that could shoot but couldn't play defense. So. <laughs> Talk about your college career, including your teammates and coaches. Hmm. Well, baseball, I, I I could talk about because that was my better sport of mm -hmm. the two. Um, at uh, there at, at OCC, I, I I really enjoyed playing down there because we we were part of I was part of the very first baseball team at at OCC, and Gene Creek wanted me to come over to to Lakeland so bad, and mm -hmm. and looking back on it, that probably was a I made a bad decision. I should have gone over there because they made it to the national tournament and, and you know, had, and the rest is history. But um, I don't know. I kind of like to be part of something mm -hmm. new. So I went down to Olney and, and uh, never did beat Lakeland. And, uh, you know, one of those deals. But, uh, <laughs> um, it, 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 you know, it, it was a lot of fun. I, I really enjoyed it and made a lot of good a lot of good friends. We still, still have a, a, a baseball reunion down at OCC. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's fun. We're, none of us are as good as we thought we were uh, back then, and we're definitely not very good now. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we go out and we play, play golf. They usually have a, a basketball fundraiser we go take part in. Talk about some of the teams and players that you got to play against in high school. Oh, boy. Uh, or, I'm sorry, college, not high school. Oh, geez. Uh, college baseball. That's a toughie. Um, some of the guys that I played against in, in college, uh, more in the Illinois Collegiates League, the CICL, they called it back then. Um, we played, a, I played with a guy named Jim Cox, uh, when I played at Bloomington, that was who I played for in the CICL. And, uh, he, uh, went on to play with the Montreal Expo, Expo um, and he was, wow. <laughs> Could he hit? I'm glad he was on our team and not. He was good, huh? Yeah, yeah. He just second baseman, but he had huge power, especially the the opposite field, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, really a a good good guy to play with. Our uh, uh, middle infielders were uh, were really good on that club. And we actually uh, Dennis Bridges was our baseball coach up there, and he's actually the Illinois Wesleyan basketball coach mm -hmm. back in those days, and now he's since retired, I'm sure, but. Uh, um, you know, there, there were guys that, uh, you know, once I got into, you know, minor league baseball is more names that people would, would, uh, I think they would relate with, but, um, you know, there was so many and, you know, I, I couldn't, I, I couldn't, if I got started, I wouldn't stop. And there is a time limit on this, I'm sure. <laughs> so name some of the favorite facilities in which you played in college. <clears throat> Hmm. Yeah. Baseball wise, uh, uh, of course, U of I is not not the the same facility or the same field back then. But it was always fun going and playing against a you know a big state school like that. Illinois State, we always went up there and played. Um, Western Illinois, uh, Southern, always was kind of impressed with Southern dugouts. They had a, those were strange looking dugouts. Really, like a little half of a Quonset. <laughs> you know, a little, <laughs> little, kind of a strange looking little thing, but uh, anyway, uh, that was. Uh, I w always thought I'd like to have gone down there. Uh, Itchy Jones was the baseball coach back in those days, and I got all kinds of contact from him. You know, coming down here, we need a left-hander, blah blah blah. You know, <laughs> and they probably didn't, but I mean, he, that's they always give you that sales pitch. Any awards you received in college? Uh, I got my degree. <laughs> that, that was that was probably about the only one. You know, I mean, I, not anything to, you know, really to to brag about in that regard. After college, you were telling me about you were in the minor leagues. Uh, were you drafted? Like, who drafted you? Well, uh, the Mets uh, were had intended to take me in a, about the ninth or tenth round. Uh, we had a shortstop at uh, at Easter named Randy Trapp. And they were going to take him like nine, me ten, 
Um, and, and I had a real good uh, outing my last, my last event. We, we, our, our team made it to the uh, uh, College Division World Series back in those days. And um, that was in Springfield, uh, up at uh, the ballpark up there. And um, Lanfear, I think Lanfear mm -hmm. Field. And uh, it, it was, uh, I was going against uh, Ithaca College out of New York. Yes. And I struck out 14 that day. And Walt Millies, the scout, said, I'll be calling you on such and such a day. Probably, you know, it was like the, the second day of the draft. And he called me, but he called me to tell me that he couldn't take me because apparently the the assistant baseball coach at EIU had told him that I broke my elbow that spring. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> yeah. And I asked him, I said, well, how, you know, what were you getting me on the gun? He said, well, 92. I said, well, did, and I went nine innings. I said, did it look like I had a broken arm? And he goes, absolutely not. But he says, I have to put it in report. And so he says, I'm sorry, but we can't take you. So um, that's when the scramble started because we didn't have a backup. We didn't have a plan B. And so um, a good friend of mine, lifelong friend was Mike Whitwicky um, um, from Mattoon and Mike, he he spent a lot of time with me working out. I, I don't know how many times I've thrown a ball from the warning track at Grimes Field and Matt Tune to him at home plate. <laughs> you know, well, you got you to gotta do that. Makes your arms stronger yep. and all that kind of thing. And so we were doing all that. And he, he knew a scout with the, with the California Angels named Nick Camsey and worked out a, a, a tryout. We drove all the way up to Quad Cities, John O'Donnell Stadium. And he had it set up that I was going to throw live BP, uh, to their, to their lineup. And, uh, I went through 12 straight and, and Kamzik decided, okay, I'm, I'm, and so I signed right there on the spot. And, and so then immediately my baseball career started that following week as far as pro ball. Really? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, that didn't take long, but anyway, you know, I, if it wasn't for Mike, I, who knows, I, I probably wouldn't have played baseball. <laughs> you know, yeah, that that would have been the end of it. But um, he was a he he grew up in the Dodger organization and played with Johnny Roseboro, mm -hmm. Maury Wills, guys like that. And and he always said he was the he was faster than they were. And um, you know, in my in my high school class, uh, uh, the fastest person in our high school class was a girl. Really? Col yeah, Colleen Baker, and she and Mike used to run sprints constantly and it was just you know they they were at it all the time and i always remember that colleen still lives right here in town so hopefully she'll get to see this that'll, <laughs> that'll pump up her ego a, a, a little bit higher <laughs> but so now yeah. that we kind of talk a little about the process of being the drafted part how far did you make it in the minor leagues uh triple a um i i started out in rookie ball at that that was a, in idaho falls idaho what they call the pioneer league uh, played there for all of about four weeks, and then I went up back to Quad Cities to finish the season. Then, and that was in 1973, 1974, uh, I went to Quad Cities, had a, played there the complete season. Uh, 75, I went to Upper A Ball, which was uh, Salinas in the Cow League. Mm -hmm. uh, there, I, I lasted till about June, and they sent me down to El Paso in, in, in the Texas League. Uh, double A, and then I went to winter ball that year in 75, and they wanted, to, wanted me to learn how to throw a third pitch. Well, I was supposed to be working on how to throw a screwball, which you don't even hear of that anymore. But it's not very all, common. Yeah, it's just a, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a pitch that's hard on your elbow, basically. Um, and But one day the pitching coach, Chuck Estrada, said, well, I want to see if you can throw a knuckleball, and I hit him in the knee. Like the first or second one, he showed me how to throw. I hit him; it, it just moved, and hit him right in the knee. And he had surgery on that knee <laughs> not too long before that, and uh, and so we worked on that. Then they sent me back to uh, Upper A ball to work on that. And then in in seventy seven, I went to Mexico City and played down there. Played there. I was losing weight right and left. I when I got down there, I weighed about two hundred five. When I came home, I think I was like one seventy, and uh, the food didn't set well with me down there. <laughs> and uh, uh, then I went to Chicago and did a tryout with uh, uh, the White Sox. 
signed the shortest contract possible up there. It lasted 30 minutes. I signed with them. They were going to send me to Knoxville, mm -hmm. which was their AAA club. But the general manager at Knoxville signed Jim Bouton, who wrote the book Ball Four. They signed him as a publicity oh my. deal. And so I got to, we got to tear up that contract, but, and that was, that was in the baseball. So, Talk about your, uh, what, what was your feeling like being drafted? Well, had I been drafted, that would have been really exciting. But I mean, go, leading up to that mm -hmm. process, I, I, you know, that time when the phone rang and it was Walt Millie's, I thought, Hey, this is good. And, and, you know, and back, back then it, it was by that broken elbow deal, um, which I did not have, but you know, that cost me about $7,500, hmm. you know, which back then was, you know, a lot of money to a kid that didn't have any money. So, uh, you know, that, that part was. So how many teams did you end up playing with? Just, just the Ainge organization is the only one, but I play, I, you know, as far as Idaho Falls, um, uh, you know, then from their quad cities, uh, Salinas of the Cal league, mm -hmm. El Paso, in Mexico City. What were some of your favorite places to play in the minors? Hmm. Um, well, Dudley Field in El Paso was not my favorite because they called it the Dudley launch pad. <laughs> when I got there, the guys were saying that you gotta keep the ball on the ground here because if it gets in the air, it's out of there. And man, was it, it really flew. It really went out of that ballpark. So you had to really be careful with that. But, um, I, I always kind of uh, got a, in, enjoyed uh, Fans Field in Decatur, and they had this this old guy that would dress up like Old Abe was his nickname. I don't know what his real name was, but mm -hmm. uh, Abe Lincoln. He dressed up like Abe Lincoln, and he was behind home plate every night. And he was back there giving signs like he was the third base coach. <laughs> and you never knew what, you know, and, and one night, uh, Jimmy Williams, my manager, he, he came out and he says, uh, Max, he says, have you figured out what the hell his signs are back there? He says, because I really, he says, all the guys in the dugout are talking about what's, what's he doing? And, and, and we never did. Nobody ever talked to him. I don't think he ever did a, uh, Bob Forster, the, the, uh, Herald and Review guy. I don't think he tried to get an interview with Abe and never could. Nobody knew what, he, what his deal was, but, but I enjoyed that ballpark. It was real homey. Yeah. Homey ballpark. But I like Quad Cities at John O'Donnell Stadium. Is there any obstacles in playing the ma in the minor leagues? Obstacles? Well, obviously you've got to stay healthy, uh, which I was fortunate. I, I never had an injury or anything in five years I played, mm -hmm. and uh, you know because if you if you get an injury, I mean it. A first of all, you got to rehab and get back healthy, and while you're doing that, somebody is up taking your place, mm -hmm. so you have to come back and be basically better than you were to get your job back, you know? And so, uh, every June was nervous time because that was, the, you know, the draft and everything coming out and, and, uh, but avoiding, avoiding injury and, and just, uh, you know, doing your job and playing hard and, and doing fundamental things, you know, correctly. Uh, somebody else can be a better talent, but if they screw up all the time, then, you're going to have, if, as long as you're doing, you're in, in a position, if you're covering first base when you're, instead of standing on the mound and, you know, picking your nose or whatever, I mean, you really, you need to be, there's a place you need to be and, and um, backing up throws and all those kinds of things. And, what does it mean to you to be a local kid that got to, that was drafted in the minor leagues? Well, you know, back, back in those days, it, it meant a lot because it was really rare. You know, we didn't have very many guys around this this area that that were drafted or went on to college to play any kind of sport, let alone professionally. Um, and so today, it's like everywhere you turn, there's you know we got so many local guys that are in the big leagues now. You know, I mean, for for a, a small rural area, you know, like where we are, I mean, it, there's a there's a lot of guys, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, one, you know, that, that we hadn't mentioned that played at Stu Straws was Brian Rothrock. Yeah. And um, I remember he's enough younger than me that I was just out of baseball, I think, about the time he was a senior in high school. And so somebody called up one day and said, hey, you want to umpire a high school game? So I, well, the home plate <laughs> umpire didn't show up. 
And I thought, crap, here I am. I, I don't I don't even have a, a license to, to, to umpire yeah. or referee or anything. And I'm out behind the mound calling balls of strikes, trying to call – I mean, it was a free-for-all. But anyway, Brian was – he was pitching. And I thought, man, these guys, what he was throwing up there, I don't care what high school it was. I mean, he really was good. You know, he's a great basketball player in high school. Um, and I think he signed with Minnesota. I'm, I'm not positive on that, but I think it was the Twins. And I think they were trying to, they were asking him to do too much with his arm, personal opinion, mm -hmm. uh, because they had him playing in the outfield because he could really hit. But at the same time, then they want him to pitch. So, you know, somewhere along the line, you know, your arm has to rest. And, not, and he didn't, his arm didn't get that chance. And so, therefore, I think someone needed to make a decision to say, you know, are you going to pitch or are you going to play the field? But one or the other, but not. Not both, but uh, man, he was, he was, he really impressed me, you know, and I'm, I'm glad I didn't have to pitch to him, <laughs> or, or I walked him. <laughs> Talk about uh, what about Chad Green, Nick Gardewine, and Danny Winkler, those local kids from Ethel. Well, that's yeah, that's perfect. Three perfect examples right there. <laughs> um, uh, those guys are all uh, they're they're living the dream at the at the level that I want to get to, but unfortunately, we're. When I was coming up in the Angel organization, we had two guys that, one being a left-hander, which really hurt my mm -hmm. situation, and, and uh, that was Frank Tanana. And he was probably uh, the next Sandy Koufax until he got a, had a, an arm injury. And otherwise, he was an easy Hall of Famer. Almost had 3,000 Ks Dang anyway. You go look, look him up. I mean, he, he was within a couple of hundred of 3,000 strikeouts. And... Uh, the other guy was Nolan Ryan, and everybody knows who that was. And, you know, the thing, getting to see him in spring training made you realize that you were in the wrong profession. <laughs> you know, I, I'd had a, a, a workout um, down there, and uh, I think I was throwing 90, 91 that day. Okay, so then we go out, and, and we're behind home plate watching Ryan. In fact, it was an inner squad, and it was Ryan against Tanana. And... Um, Ryan's curveball, and I mean, it was a true curveball. It wasn't a slider, nothing like that. It was just a good old 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock breaking ball, and I think he topped out with that at about 89 miles an hour, and guys are looking around like, hmm, we don't have that, and I he threw seven no-hitters in his career. I don't know how he only threw seven wow. with the stuff that he had. Yeah. You know, just unbelievable. He probably just accidentally hit somebody's bat occasionally. <laughs> um, but he's the best I ever saw. At what age did you become interested in sports? <laughs> I don't know. Whenever I was big enough to roll a ball around on the floor and <laughs> chase it, I guess. I, I, I've, always, I've always liked, you know, about... Mm -hmm. every every sport that you know came along i mean i couldn't skate so i didn't like hockey i love to watch hockey mm -hmm. but the only hockey game i went to i got to see wayne gretzky play so that was kind of a big <laughs> deal but i like i love ski a local doctor here in town got uh uh got uh, myself and russell rinker a long time friend classmate and he was our best man at our wedding and he got us started shooting skeet in a winter league out here at the gun club and um, I'll never forget that um, we had a 400 target league. And I, I only missed four targets in that league for, for the whole year. Mm -hmm. and, and I still got beat. Uh, I was second to Russell, you know. But he was really, really good, <laughs> good wing shooter. And I know you're going to want to go, well, he, he missed less than four is all I know. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean it was, <laughs> but we we had a we used to hunt together all the time and and uh, since you played, how has the game changed? Baseball? Yeah. Oh, it takes way too long. Um, I probably wouldn't allow batting gloves. <laughs> <laughs> Guys are sp spending so much time stepping out. Um, you're allowed to show up the pitcher. 
you know, guys hit a home run, just do your job, run around the bases, and don't try to show anybody. No, don't flip the bat. Don't um, don't do things. Because back when I played, if you did that, you got hit. Um, good story I remember. And, and this is probably a player that, that you won't remember, but his name was Jeffrey Leonard. And he was in the Giants organization back back when I played. I think he spent most of his career in the Giants and Dodgers organization. And um, he, he was... Um, one of those guys that that if he if he hit a home run, if you were a left-hander, when he round the bases, he would hang his left arm. You know, it was his the saying was, well, one arm down, and that's how he would go around the bases. And the year that I faced him was in the Cal League, um, and um, he did that, and, and I played for a, a guy named Buck Rogers, who was a had a 16 year career in the in the big leagues as a catcher, and he and, and he was so hot when Leonard did that that when he came up the the plate the next time, um, we hit him. You know, wow, you're gonna get a rib sandwich right here because <laughs> you just don't you just didn't. But today it's just like wide so widespread, and stepping out of the box so much. So many visits to the mound, and and uh, the game is so much more specialized as far as pitching because everybody knows. Okay, you've got this inning, you've got that inning. It's like when Nolan Ryan was a GM with the Texas Rangers, he told all the coaches and the manager, said, "We're not going to do. You know, we're not going to. We're not. There's no pitch count. You just." Yeah, might know that would go off. Uh, and and so he said, I want you to be in condition to go go the full route, go nine innings. And then if then if you run into trouble, okay, we'll get somebody up. Mm -hmm. But today it's it's so much more attention is it's on the manager, on all the specialization, and it makes a a two hour and fifteen minute game becomes four hours. Mm -hmm. That's it's taking what I think now. needs to change, yeah. you know. Gosh, we used to play double headers in five hours. You know, wow. I mean, that's. What advice would you give to today's youth about playing sports? Uh, put all the laptops and the cell phones and lose that stuff and get outside and play because it's just so much, so much technology and, you know, everything that, that you know, like golf, kids don't get started playing golf because they're so busy, you know, like that thing going off, you know. I mean, everybody's everybody's either they're going to text, they're going to email, they're going to do do those things, and I would rather see, you know, kids used to be at the city park, you couldn't, you had to wait your turn to get on the court because there'd, there'd be 10 guys playing and there'd be 10 more, even in a town this size. You don't get to do that, you know. Mm -hmm. it, that doesn't happen anymore. And, and you, you were at, talking about some of the most memorable events. that just had something flash in my head mm -hmm. about. Yeah, go ahead. In, in um, when I was playing in Quad Cities in 1974, we had a we had an off day, and, but we had BP and, and and all that. And and as soon as we got done, there was this crew came out and they started building a wrestling rink, <laughs> um, uh, out there. And I thought, man, what's you know. But they had a big fair that was in town and everything. So as we went in, uh, going back in to shower up and everything, well, Frenchie Larroquette, our little clubhouse boy, he came out and he says, uh, uh, Max, he says, you guys aren't going to be able to get to your cubicle. And we're like, well, why not? You know, he says, well, there's guys in there getting dressed. They're getting ready to go out and they're going to going to wrestle. And uh, I couldn't. Could not believe my eyes when we walked back to our aisle. There were the two biggest human beings I've ever seen, and one of them was Chris Taylor, who wrestled the in in the, I think it was the seven I forget it was the seventy six Olympics, and got the silver medal against the big Russian, and the other guy was Andre the Giant. Oh and, my! And these two guys were like a thousand pounds between them. I mean, Chris Taylor looked like a little guy. He was like six five and four fifty, and Andre was seven four, five fifty, and and I got to shake hands, you know. But Andre the Giant, literally, my hand would fit in the palm of his hand. <laughs> oh my! Yeah, and they were telling about how he, he, how many steaks he would eat in a meal, and 
and he'd drink a case of beer just to drink with the steaks and 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 I think his shoe size, if I remember, was like like thirty two or thirty three. Holy cow! And his hat size was fourteen. Guy was just <laughs> like a grizzly bear without the fur. I mean, just, just <laughs> I mean, but that was that was a kind of a kind of a cool <clears throat> thing, you know. That, what has sports done to change your life, Rod? <clears throat> hmm. Well, I can't answer that because I don't know what it would have been like without it. <laughs> you know, I really, I really don't. I mean, um, it seems like that sports has been some sport, not always the same one, but there's always been some sport, you know, that was a part of it. Um, I, I don't, uh, I really, I really can't answer it. I mean, I, it, I, I've never been without it. Mm -hmm. you know it's always been well I mean as I got older golf became my interest and whenever I quit playing baseball and basketball um, you know I played just independent league baseball until I was about 30 same way with basketball and I decided I was going to quit both those at, when I turned 30 because I didn't want to break something that I'd regret you know as far as tearing up a leg or a knee some way um, so now it's golf you know, and, and uh, you got to have a, you have to have a passion for something sometime. And I, I guess maybe golf is something I can do, you know. Uh, I sure can't do the bowling thing, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> Who are some of your biggest role models? <clears throat> Gosh. Um, well, uh, one of our, uh, our superintendent, uh, Russell Curry, when I was in high school, I always really, Really looked up to him, and uh, he's uh, he was always special. And Cardinal, oh my God, Cardinal fan like no tomorrow. And <laughs> he's got got three sons, and they're all followed suit, you know, with with that. And uh, but we used to have some of the darndest conversations about oh Stan Musial and and Bob Gibson and guys like that, you know, that just compare notes and what do you think? And uh, but Russell Curry was, he was one of my, one of my favorite people along with Mike Witwicky mm -hmm. because of the, on the, the baseball side of things. And uh, so it was, uh, uh, you know, those two people had, had a lot of influence, I would say, you know, and, uh, you know, of course your parents are always right there, but uh, my dad died when I was young and, and my mom lived to be 102. She hadn't tripped over a, something in the house she lived right next door right here and she just passed away two years ago and i and i don't she might still be here if she hadn't fallen and broken the hip uh you know but i mean it's just one of those things that happened sorry to hear that rod yeah i mean you know it's it's that she lived a long life and wow. uh, um so i mean there's so many people that have yeah you can't name them all what's your what's uh what's your current occupation Nothing, and I'm better at this than that was anything else I've ever done. Yeah, this retirement thing is good. Um, so I, I piddle around and go mow fairways for people. I'm not naming names here or anything, but you know, one of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it, I've actually mowed for Sullivan Country Club uh, a little bit, and uh, guy over at Mattoon Country Club has asked me to kind of be a fill in over there. And so, you know, if somebody calls, I'll, I'll go jump on a machine, but you know, I'm not. I'm not looking to, you know, go, go crazy about it. I kind of like being able to, you know, if my buddy calls and says, Hey, what time can you play golf? Well then we're going to find a, find a time, you know, how so, tall are you? Six, two. Is your family tall? Mm, not particularly. No, not particularly. No. Rod, is there anything else you'd like to share in closing? Uh, yeah, this has been fun. I enjoyed I've, it. I've, I've, I've really enjoyed it. Uh, I, I did have a, a a friend of mine came by the other day. In fact, he's a basketball coach. He, well, he just retired. Bob Hurts over at Shelbyville. He he would be one I would recommend that you you do this with because oh, you you better you better plan on four or five hours. Um, <laughs> but but uh, with the all the rules with with you know uh, uh, because of the COVID nineteen thing, uh, guys are needing lightweight carry bags, and so. Um, Next to Tim Krause at the pro shop down in Effingham, I probably have more golf bags downstairs than <laughs> most people should have. And my wife would probably chime in on that. And uh, so anyway, Bob came by the other day and I, I set a 
uh, golf bag out for him. And I couldn't believe how long his hair was. Of course, <laughs> mine's not short either, but yeah, you know, he, uh, we were just talking about not being able to get to the barber shop or wherever, <laughs> you know, to get a haircut. And, and, uh, uh, but he would be, he would be one that would be, should be on your list to uh, sit down with. Cause he coached, uh, uh, Malcolm Miller mm -hmm. just here, just, uh, great player. Yeah. Outstanding two, year, two player. years ago. Or, yep. Well, I guess he just, well, is he a freshman? Malcolm is a sophomore at Illinois state this year. Sophomore. Yeah. Okay. He was a freshman last year. Okay. He was, a, he was, he's all time winning scorer at Shelbyville. For yeah. Basketball. Yeah. Yeah. 2200. Oh gosh. Point. He's a good friend of mine. Yeah. Yep, and Bob coached him, yep. and, and uh, of course he's got. Oh, the reason that Bob's hair is so long, and and this is this is a funny. I got to tell us on it. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, he's got a a bet going on with Mason, the younger brother. Yeah, you know who's going to yep. cut their hair first. And <laughs> really, yeah. So you might want to follow up on that. And and if you happen to, if you need to know how to get a hold of Bob, I. I know, <laughs> I know people that can hook you up. So. How long is how long is Bob the coach there? Oh, I don't know. He's probably coached for thirty some years. All oh wow, you know he's, yeah. he's you know played played really good player at EIU. Wow, um, he's uh, Bob's about three years older than me, I think, and uh, and his hair is a lot longer, and he's <laughs> definitely got a beard. So uh, he'd be one that you you should. Yeah, he'd tell you more more stories, and you could have time to research. Right, I I really enjoyed hearing your stories. Yeah, yeah, some interesting stories I did not know about. Um, yeah. Also, the minor leagues that was interesting to hear yeah. some of the people you played against and with. So, yeah. I appreciate your time, Rod, and I look forward to talking to you in, in the later future. Okay, very good. Thanks for having me.